Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in today's presentation we're going to be looking at sedimentary rocks part 2. So this is a bit of a larger presentation so it's going to be split into two separate uh, presentations. So here we go. So deep tissue environments. So a deep tissue environment is simply anywhere where sediment accumulates. And the accumulation of this sediment can be driven by three specific processes. There can be physical processes, biological processes, or chemical processes that can encourage sediment to be deposited in a set area. So the processes that occur will obviously be distinct to each different deep positional environment. And obviously because each different deep positional environment has a different set of processes occurring in it, it's going to produce a distinct sediment. And obviously as we've discussed, it's the challenge of a geologist to try and take the evidence that we can see in the rock and use that to work out what the sedimentary environment of deep position was. So deep position environments will fall into one of three broad groups. So there's the continental environments, that's obviously where sediment is being deposited on the continents. So that's environments like deserts, glaciers, and most importantly, rivers and lakes. So freshwater environments as well. They are also considered to be continental. Then we have transitional environments, that's environments like beaches and deltas. So those are locations that spend some time submerged underwater and some time exposed to the atmosphere. And then we have marine environments. Those are environments that spend their entire time fully submerged in seawater. So that's environments like the continental shelf, carbonate shelves, the deep ocean plain, etc. And of course, each of these broad areas of deposition will contain several specific sub-environments of deposition. So this is the diagram from the textbook, and you can see that I've, I've crudely circled the three broad areas. So in terms of continental environments, we have environments like alluvial fans and sand dunes. Those are part of the desert environment. We have lakes, glaciers, and stream environments, so river systems, fluvial systems. We also have transitional environments. Those are the ones which are, you know, are typically coastal and they'll spend some of their time above sea level and some of their time below sea level. And that's going to include environments like beaches, deltas, tidal flats, barrier islands, and lagoons. And then finally, we have environments which are completely submerged underwater 100% of the time. So that's going to include environments like the continental shelf, organic reefs, the deep marine environment, and environments like submarine fans, turbidity currents. So in terms of the continental environment, what we're going to do is we obviously can't go through every single sub-environment because the list is just huge. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on a few of the main ones. So we're going to spend some time looking at fluvial systems. So that's rivers, streams, and most importantly, their floodplains as well. So never forget, when we're talking about fluvial systems, we're not just talking about the river channel itself. We are also talking about the area either side of the channel that gets covered in sediment every time the river floods. Obviously, there's lake environments, desert environments. Once again, there are sub-environments, the desert environments. There's alluvial fans, desert plains, and player lakes. And then we have areas covered by or adjacent to glaciers. So the deposition from the deposition of sediment in these environments possess a combination of features that allow us to differentiate between these environments and determine that they were deposited on land. Okay, so let's start with fluvial systems or river systems. So this refers to the actions of rivers and streams and the sediments that they deposit. So fluvial deposits can accumulate in two main types of stream. There are braided river systems and meandering river systems. There are other types of river, but braided and meandering are by far and away the two more common types. So deep position will form, well, deep position will occur, should I say, within the channel, producing a elongate shoestring geometry. So the channel itself is going to be filled typically with sandy sediments, maybe a little bit of gravel-sized material mixed in there as well. And you're also going to have deep position occurring on the floodplain either side of the river. So those, those, uh, that sediment's going to be deposited as sheets, so it's going to have blanket geometry. And it's going to be dominated mostly by clays and silts with a little bit of sand mixed in there. So the channel itself and the floodplain are going to have distinctly different textures to them and compositions. 
Okay, so here's a diagram that's going to help us try and work out, well, why do we get the type of river that we have? So if we look on the left-hand side here, it's going to list three different types of rivers. So we have straight rivers, meandering rivers, and braided rivers. Now, the thing about straight rivers, straight rivers tend to occur in areas where the water is moving very, very quickly. So they tend to be associated with the very early stages of rivers forming in mountains. And so because the water is moving so fast, it's got so much energy, the river will literally just cut a completely straight channel. So in terms of straight channels, we're not really going to worry about them too much because the other reason, the other problem is, is that because the water is moving so quickly, there's actually typically... Uh, less deposition going on because all the materials being moved so we're not going to concern ourselves with straight rivers too much we're going to focus on meandering and braided so if we look at these factors down here it's going to help us try and work out you know what's controlling whether we get a braided river or a meandering river so the first thing we need to look at is the diagram here so meandering rivers are here and here and, and they're located at what's referred to as the uh, the higher relative stability and braided rivers are down here at the lower end of relative stability that means essentially how stable is your river channel so over time a meandering river channel will move around a bit however it stays pretty much as is okay so the the, the, the meandering river might change shape a little bit but on the whole it's a very slow gradual change in contrast, a braided river system is quite a chaotic place. As you can see, there's multiple river channels all moving in the same direction at the same time, and they're all crossing each other. So what you have is a situation where no one river you know, is really discernible. They're all crossing across each other, and so the system is very, very chaotic and very, very changeable. So the river channel itself is quite unstable. It will you know, quite happily change you know, the, uh, the way that it's traveling you know, on a whim. So what other factors can we see that are affecting, you know, what type of river we're going to get? Well, the next factor we're going to look at is the sediment size. Now, braided rivers tend to be associated with higher altitude environments. So they tend to be found in mountainous terrain. This typically means the, the water contained within the river is dropping quite quickly. And obviously, because the river is dropping quite quickly, that means the water is going to have quite a lot of velocity and power. And so this obviously means it can transport quite large class. So your average braided river can transport cobbles, gravels, sands, silts, and clays quite easily. In contrast, when we're dealing with a meandering river, you'll notice that the sediment size is quite small. Well, that's because the environment that the meandering river is traveling across has quite a low gradient. The, the ground is quite uh, level, it's quite flat. So this means the water isn't dropping very quickly, so that means the water does not have a high velocity and therefore it does not have a high stream power. So this means that a meandering river ha is, you know, has less oomph essentially, has less energy. So it makes it a bit more difficult for it to, to move around, cut, you know, cut a new path for itself. That's one of the reasons why it's so stable. Because it's such a low energy, lower energy environment, it doesn't have the capacity to you know, go where it wants. In contrast, a braided river, because the water is moving so quickly and it's got so much power, the river can literally go, right, I want to go that direction, and it will happily cut a path in that direction. So when it comes to uh, meandering rivers, typically... The water's moving slower, and that means less stream power, and obviously as there's less stream power, that means it can only transport small sediment. So most meandering rivers are going to be associated with clays, silts, and sands. You may get a bit of gravel, but it will be very fine gravel, and that will only be located in the river channel itself. In terms of the sediment load, so the amount of material being moved, well, pound for pound, a, a, um, a braided river system is going to move more material because the water is moving faster and it has more power. Braided uh, meandering rivers, on the other hand, unfortunately, because the water is moving slower and has less power, it will move less material. Now, as a whole, if you you know total up the you know, the the amount of water in braided river systems. Braided river systems contain a lot more water in them compared to, sorry, meandering river systems, I do apologise, contain a lot more water in them compared to a braided river system. 
So, you know, this means for every cubic meter of water moving through a braided river system, well, yes, it might have more velocity, it might have more power, and so it can move more sediment. However, because there's more water in the meandering river system as a whole, even though that water has less velocity and less stream power, there's so much of it that in reality it actually transports a lot of sediment. So just bear that in mind. You know, so, so you know, pound for pound, a braided river system is you know, more powerful, has more energy, can move larger sediments and move larger amounts of it. But because a, river, a meandering river system by its very nature is just so much larger than your average braided system, as a whole, it will actually be moving more material. So the controlling factors which are going to you know, help, to, help to control what type of river we get are going to be the slope. So the steeper the slope, the higher the velocity and the higher the stream power. So that's going to mean you'll be more likely to get a braided river. We then have the sediment load. The higher the stream power, the higher the quantity and size of sediment that can be moved. So once again, steep environments produce fast-flowing, powerful rivers which are going to have quite a high sediment load. And then finally we have the erodibility of the banks. So that's a combination of the material that the banks are made of and how powerful your river is. So if your river is powerful, obviously it has the capacity to cut a channel where it wants. Combine that with the question of whether the material that the river is trying to erode is you know, well consolidated or weakly consolidated. So something like a braided river system has quite poorly consolidated banks and that you know, that on top of the fact the river is so powerful helps the river to take whatever path it feels it wants. In contrast, a meandering river is a weaker river and it's passing through material which is quite cohesive. It's made up mostly of clays and silts, so it's quite difficult to erode. And so once again, that means the, the river essentially gets, you know, once it's found its path, it pretty much sticks to it. Okay, so here we have a picture of a braided river system. So you, you, first thing you'll notice is we have multiple channels all moving in the same direction. So these channels are broad, so they're very wide, but they're also very shallow. It's not uncommon in braided river systems for you to literally be able to wade from one side to the other. Try doing that with a, a large meandering river like the Mississippi, you'll get in trouble pretty fast. So the sediments that are being moved by braided river systems and therefore the rocks that form from those sediments are dominated by gravels and sands. And these gravel and sand layers are going to form an elongate sheet geometry. So what you're going to get is you're going to get an elongate shape. So you can see we have a, an elongate shape. It, you know, we have a, essentially a, a linear feature coming towards us. This is our, our, our river system. And in terms of the sediment itself, it's being deposited within this river system as sheets. So we have this elongate form within which we have layers of sediment deposited one on top of another. In terms of mud, so silts and clays, they're actually nearly absent from braided river systems. So most braided river sediments are going to be made up of gravels, sands, maybe cobbles. But muds and clay, uh, silts and clays will be pretty much non-existent. And the reason for that is, is that the water in these rivers is moving so quickly, it never slows down enough to allow clays and silts to settle out. It's always moving, so the clays and silts can't drop out of suspension. And so because they can't drop out of suspension, they never get deposited, and as they're never getting deposited, they never become incorporated into the sediment. So the channels are separated by islands, which we refer to as braid bars. And you can see them here. Here's a nice example. You can see one braid bar right there. Now, one of the things you'll notice is compared to the land either side in this area here, braid bars have very little vegetation on them. And that's because braid bars are made of mostly uh, gravels, and, uh, gravels and cobbles. So it's very poorly consolidated material in an environment where you have these fast flowing powerful rivers and so braid bars because they're such you know weak material they will be eroded away on a regular basis so over time the braid bars will be lost so they'll be destroyed and new braid bars will form in their place that's why the braid bars you can see in this picture are not heavily vegetated because vegetation doesn't really have enough time to establish itself So braided river systems tend to occur in areas with high slopes, uh, so typically mountainous areas. That obviously means you have a powerful river, 
So that river is going to have you know a high velocity and a, a high sediment load. But it also, because you're in mountainous areas, that's an area where you get very, very high rates of erosion. So there's going to be abundant sediment for your river to move. However, braided rivers don't just occur within mountainous environments. They can also occur in environments where you get sudden high flows of water. So something like a, a very heavy thunderstorm in a desert environment. Deserts, by their very nature, tend to be you know sandy. There tends to be a lot of gravel around. So there's lots of sediment to be transported. But obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, most of the time there's no river there. However, when you get one of these very heavy rainstorms, you will get these short-lived, fast-flowing rivers. So you'll get these, you know, temporary braided river systems forming in desert environments. You can also get uh, braided river systems forming in areas where you get very large quantities of sediment accumulating. So something like a delta. So even though a delta, by its very nature, is not the classic braided river system. Uh, it's not the, not the kind of criteria you would expect for your average braided, braided river system. So the ground tends to be quite flat. So that means the water doesn't actually tend to be moving very quickly through a delta. So the, the channels themselves, you know, the rivers aren't particularly high energy. However, because there is so much sediment in a delta environment, and that sediment is so weakly consolidated, even though your river is quite weak, it has the capacity to cut a channel in the direction that it wants and to move the sediment as it sees fit and so what will happen is you'll end up cutting multiple channels so you'll end up with these braided river systems in deltas as well even though the water itself in these channels isn't actually moving that fast it doesn't have that much power so braided streams are constantly have uh, abundant fresh sediment added to them obviously because they tend to form in areas of very high uh, erosion and of course, because you have all this new sediment constantly being added, that means the sediment that makes up the banks of the river and these and these uh, braid bars is very, very uh, weak. It's not well consolidated, and so that means it can be eroded very, very easily, so the river can once again go where it wants. Now, the thing is, is because we have such a high sediment load, and that sediment is quite coarse, so remember we have cobbles, gravels, sands, silts and clays. Now the silts and clays never settle out so we can forget those. But it means because we have such large amounts of cobbles, gravels and sands in our system, the second there's any kind of minor change in the velocity, so also the power of our river, the larger sediment will get dumped very very quickly. So if there's any kind of waning in the stream velocity, the cobbles, the gravels will very quickly get dropped and obviously they won't move again until the velocity increases. So the sediments that are deposited as part of a braided river system tend to be conglomerates. So we tend to get these coarse sediments made up of gravels and cobbles. But obviously because they're conglomerates, they have rounded or rounded to sub-rounded clasts. And the reason for that is a braided river system is quite energetic. And so what we, what we get is we get these clasts banging into each other very, very quickly. So they get rounded off quite fast. So braided river systems will tend to have these coarse sediments containing rounded to sub-rounded class, so they'll form conglomerates. We will also get cross-bedded sandstones in the environment, and they will be more representative of the river channels themselves. Mudstones, as discussed, are not common because the clay in the silt just gets transported out of the area. In terms of braided rivers themselves, they're actually the dominant type of river until the Ordovician, so what, 480 something million years ago. Now around that time, so in the Ordovician, that's when the first land plants start to appear. And the thing that land plants have are root systems. And so as you move from the Ordovician into the Silurian and plants with large root systems begin to become more and more common, those root systems help to start to bind the uh, the banks of rivers together so it makes you know increases increases the cohesiveness of the material that the river is trying to pass through so it's more difficult for the river to erode it and so what you see is you begin to see as you move from the Ordovician into the Silurian you start to see braided river systems becoming less common and meandering rivers becoming more common and we can relate it pretty much back to the fact that plants are beginning to establish themselves and the plants are helping to bind the soil together more efficiently. So if we have a look at this braided river system, what can we see? Well, these are our braid bars here, and you'll notice they're quite coarse looking, aren't they? So they're a mixture of cobbles and gravels mostly. 
If you look at the river itself, yes, there's going to be some quarter stuff in there, some cobbles and gravels, but we're also going to have a lot of sand in the river channel here, which is being moved along by the water. So the braid bars themselves tend to be cobble and gravel, so they tend to form conglomerates, whereas the river channel itself will tend to be represented by sandstones, typically quite a coarse sandstone, and that sandstone, obviously because it's part of a river system, so unidirectional flow, the water goes in just one direction, and obviously that's going to mean we're going to end up with asymmetrical ripples as part of our uh, channel sandstone. And so if we take a, a slice for a sequence of sediments deposited by a river system, we will tend to see uh, conglomerates which represent braid bars getting covered over by sandstones that represent rivers, and then we'll get more conglomerates into another braid bar, more, uh, more cross-bedded sandstone, essentially representing river channels and so on. So what you can see is we have a sequence of sediments consisting of these braid bar conglomerates and these river channel sandstones. Muds are very, very uncommon. So you're not going to get siltstones, you're not going to get claystones in this system. So this is the kind of classic uh, braided river system. So we're in a mountainous area, we have loads of sediment coming off the high ground, so we have a very high sediment input. Sediment input, we have a steep slope, so the water's dropping down under gravity very, very quickly. So we have lots of sediment, a fast-flowing river that has lots of power. And so the river can go where it wants, and it has plenty of sediment to transport. Now, these two environments here, these are braided river systems in the, you know, in the sense that uh, you know, they are, well, they are braided river systems, but the environments they're forming in aren't the type of environments you would normally expect a braided river system to form in. So here we have braided river systems associated with short-lived, fast-flowing desert rivers. Okay, so there's going to be a very heavy rainstorm, it's going to produce a river, and you can see the lighter areas here represent the river channels, and you can see that you know, there are these braid bars in between them there, 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 for instance. So these are these are braided river systems. They don't they're not around for very long, and they are very sporadic in their in their occurrence because they rely on these very short-lived, very heavy rainstorms to form. But once again, as we already touched on, because we're in a desert environment, it means there is going to be abundant sediment around, and so that's obviously going to mean that you know we have a fast-flowing body of water with abundant sediment, and so we're going to form a braided river system. And then finally here we have a delta system. Well, once again, we have a situation where we have abundant sediment. Now, in this case, the water itself isn't moving that quickly because the terrain is relatively flat. But because we have all of this sediment and it's relatively loosely consolidated, the river can pretty much go where it wants. So it cuts multiple channels. And so we end up with a braided river system. And you can see that quite nicely here. You know, you've got a lovely uh, braid bar right there, for instance. Excuse the leaf blur in the background if you can hear that. That's my neighbour doing his lawns. So now let's think about meandering rivers. So a meandering river will tend to form in an area of lower angle. So the slope has decreased. This means stream velocity decreases. It means stream power decreases. Therefore, it means your river has less capacity to erode its banks. We'll also see a decrease in the size of the sediment because obviously if the river has less power, it can no longer move coarser material. So meandering rivers don't tend to have cobbles associated with them, and if they do have gravel, it will tend to be very, very fine gravel. So the th one of the uh, problems that meandering rivers have is they start moving through an area where bank cohesion, so the material the river is trying to move through, is actually quite high. So because meandering rivers tend to be associated with environments where there's lots of uh, mud and silt, clay and silt in, mixed in with the sediment, that means it's quite cohesive stuff. And so your river will find it difficult to cut multiple channels. And so what the river will do is it will focus its water all into one single deep channel. And so if you look at a meandering river system, you don't have multiple channels all moving parallel to each other or cutting across each other. You've funneled all of that water into just one deep channel. So obviously a meandering river by its very nature is quite easy to spot because it has this, you know, sign, you know, has this very sinuous appearance, doesn't it? And obviously each one of these curves that we can see here is called a meander. So meandering rivers obviously have meanders. So the question is, is, well, how do we actually end up with these meanders? 
Well, the answer is actually quite straightforward. So if you imagine that these wonderful diagrams, drawn by my own fair hand, um, represent a river. So here's our original river. And you can see our original river is almost straight. However, it's not quite perfectly straight. There's a slight kink here, isn't there? Well, even though the river is almost straight, it means that as the water is moving along, because the water here is going on the outside of the bend, it means it has to flow slightly faster than the water on the inside of the bend. And so because it's moving slightly faster, it has more energy. Because it has more energy, it has the capacity to, capacity to erode more efficiently. And so on the outsides of these bends, the areas marked by the red lines here, the water is moving faster, it has more energy, it can erode. So what happens is over time, erosion kicks in and it starts to accentuate these corners. Okay, And as erosion continues, the accentuation becomes even stronger. So we eventually end up going from this ever so slight kink in our river channel to a strong, well-defined meander. And it's just to do with the fact that the water on the outside of the meander is moving faster than the water on the inside. In terms of meandering rivers themselves, they tend to be just a single channel. However, you can sometimes have meandering river systems that have multiple channels. They're referred to as anastomosing systems. So this is your standard meandering channel here. You can see just one channel. You can actually see the scars left by the river where it used to flow. So those are abandoned channels there. Okay. In terms of anastomosing rivers, so here's an anastomosing system. So you can actually see we have these meandering rivers. There's one coming in here. We have another meandering river here. We have another meandering river here. And they're all going in the same direction. So the question is, well, why in this particular instance do we have multiple rivers versus just one? So the situation is, is anastomosing rivers consist of several deep meandering channels, which, you know, will they'll divide and they'll you know, reconnect with each other. So the channels are separated by semi-permanent islands made from cohesive clay or silt. So these bodies in between the river channels are quite robust. They're very difficult to erode and get rid of. The other reason why you have these multiple channels is because these areas in between the river channels tend to be higher ground. And so if you imagine that this area here is high ground, well, the river flow on this side is flowing down one side of it. The river on this side is going down the other side of it. And so you've got two channels in this, you know, flowing in the same direction, running parallel to each other, but they can't meet and join up until the high ground finishes right here. And so these anastomosing systems tend to occur in areas where we have very cohesive uh, banks, but we also have, you know, rather hilly terrain, which encourages the rivers to uh, obviously flow you know, along the edges of the hills, and they'll only join together once the topography disappears. So in terms of meandering rivers, there are two sub-environments. There's the river channel itself, and then there's the floodplain. So obviously this lighter area here, that represents the river channel, and the vegetated area either side, that's the floodplain. So the area that gets covered in fresh sediment every time the river floods. So the river channel itself is going to be dominated by sandy sediments. There may also be some fine gravel mixed in there you will not tend to get a lot of mud associated with rivers in with the channel sediments because because the water's moving and as we've already touched on if you want to get silts and clays to drop out of suspension your water needs to be almost stationary and so because the water in the river channel is not stationary it's constantly moving it means the silt and clay never really has the opportunity to drop out and so most river channel sediments tend to be sand dominated maybe with a hint of gravel in terms of the morphology in three dimensions, you get this elongate shoestring morphology. So if you were to look at the sands you know, within the river channel uh, in three dimensions, you would see these, the, these sandstones would form a pattern that looks like this. So you'd actually be able to trace the old path taken by the river. Obviously, because a river channel is unidirectional, you will get asymmetrical ripples forming. And if you have a very, very large river, you can actually also get dunes forming in the river itself. So by large river, I'm talking rivers like the Nile, the Amazon, the Congo, for instance. And then obviously in terms of fossils, freshwater fossils are to be expected. So we look for things like you know, freshwater fish fossils and freshwater mollusk fossils.
Now the floodplain either side is going to have a different set of conditions. So the floodplain is a low energy environment. So the river floods, the water comes to a complete stop and it deposits its sediment. Now because the water is you know, coming to a, a you know, coming to a complete stop, it means clays and silts within that water will be able to drop out. And so floodplains tend to be dominated by clay and silt sized clasts with a minor sand component. So this means that floodplain sediments will typically be claystones, siltstones, or just mudstones in general. There's also a difference in the morphology. So a river, remember, so the channel itself has this elongate shoestring morphology. It wiggles around all over the place. In contrast, a floodplain, because the sediment's being deposited as one sheet, it will have a blanket morphology. So the layer itself will be quite thin, but it will be spread out over, la over a laterally quite extensive area. Obviously, because we're dealing with a low energy environment where clay and silt is steadily uh, settling out of floodwaters, we are going to end up with laminated mudstones. And because the sediment will eventually dry out, it will crack, so we'll actually end up producing mud cracks in floodplain sediments as well. In terms of fossils, we all tend to see a lot of root casts. So a root cast is a trace fossil left by the root of a plant, so a tree or a very large bush. So these large roots will, um, will essentially disturb the sediment and the, uh, although the root itself will rot away, the uh, root cast, the, the area affected by the root, will be visible in the sediment. And so you can, you, know, you can see these root cast marks within these floodplain sediments. You'll also get the fossils of land-dwelling animals as well. So in terms of sediment deposition in river systems, obviously sediment's going to get deposited on the floodplain when the river floods. But in terms of the river channel itself, deposition will occur in the cores of the meander. So here's our river here, and it's coming around like this. So we have one meander here, one meander here, one meander here, and one meander here. And the cores of these meanders, so there, 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 and there, are areas where the water is moving more slowly. So remember, as the water enters a meander, the water on the outside has to accelerate, hence the fact it has more power and the ability to erode. Whereas the water on the inside of the meander actually flows more slowly, so it loses energy. And so this means because it's flowing more slowly, it will start to deposit the coarser sediments. And so in these, in the cores of the meanders, we're going to get the deposition of a very fine gravel and coarse sand sediments. So you can see it here in this picture. Notice how the material being deposited in the core of this meander has a very sandy look to it. And you can see here's another meander over here and there is once again the sediment being deposited in the core of the meander. And so uh, these sediments are referred to as point bar sediments. So this material here is referred to as the point bar. Now they can be distinguished from the river channel sediments because the sediment typically the, the sediment um, is typically gravel free. So what you'll get here is a mostly sandy sediment. The gravels will be actually in the river channel itself. So this will be a mostly sandy sediment. It will have this lenticular geometry. So the body of sediment itself will be narrow at one end. It will get broader in the middle and then it will narrow to the other end. So once again, just like a football. And we may get asymmetrical ripples forming but they're less common than in a river channel deposit. Okay, because in a river channel you have this unidirectional flow which is going to produce ripples constantly, whereas in the point bar environment they, the sediment's exposed and it will be reworked by a number of different processes and obviously this means you're going to lose things like the asymmetrical ripples. In terms of the kinds of sequences of sediment that we would expect to get associated with rivers, obviously we have sediments associated with the river channel, so that's going to be a mixture of sands mostly and gravels, and the sands themselves are going to obviously contain these asymmetrical ripples, and maybe, if the river is large enough, cross beds, which are related to dunes. In terms of point bar sediments, which form in the cores of the meanders, we would expect to see, once again, a, quite a sandy sediment. It may have cross bedding, it may not. And then we'll have sediments associated with the floodplains, which are going to be dominated mostly by uh, clays and silts.
you're going to have a laminated mudstone most of the time, you're going to see root casts, and you may find fossils of land-dwelling organisms in there as well. So the sequence of sediments is actually quite straightforward. So if we look at this diagram here, we saw this a second ago, the orange ends of the bars represent the floodplain sediments, the yellow area represents the uh, point bar, and the blue represents the river sediments, the channel sediments. So if we look at this diagram here, here's the same bar. So we've got floodplain, point bar, river channel, and back to the floodplain again. And as we've discussed, because the water is moving more quickly on the outside edge here, we're going to have erosion on the outer edge of the river and deposition on the inner edge of the river. And so over time, because we've got erosion here, our river is going to want to move to the right. And so what's going to happen is over time, as more and more sediment builds up, our river is going to slowly migrate to the right, like so. And so what we're going to end up with is a sequence of sediments that looks like this. Floodplain sediments at the bottom, covered by river sediments, covered by point bar sediments, and then back to floodplain sediments again. So you can see how we end up with this type of sedimentary package. It's actually quite you know, easy to do. Okay, this is a really good place to stop part one. So uh, stop the video, get up, have a walk around, go in a glass of water, take a few minutes to relax, and then please come back for part two.